good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business, and tonight we're going to continue our dive into the first of the short stories contained within the pages of the Bachman books. Rage. When we last left Charlie, he was on the way to the principal's office. He had stopped to eat some Ritz crackers because Charlie has a bad stomach. He took his time so that when he got to the office, he would just go into the principal's office instead of sitting outside, which he hates. His dad's friend, Al Lathrop, was sitting across from him because he sold textbooks and was making his rounds around the school. Or to the schools, I should say. Charlie put the fucking nails to him and made him squirm. And then, because Charlie's a good person deep down, he felt bad for putting the putting the screws to old Al, you know? It's just like Charlie said. Just because he heard Al say he was going to kill his wife doesn't mean that he really meant it, right? Right. Chapter 5 I came awake with a jerk out of a nightmare I hadn't had for a long time. A dream where I was in some dark blind alley and something was coming for me. Some dark hunched monster that creaked and dragged itself along. A monster that would drive me insane if I saw it. Bad dream. I hadn't had it since I was a little kid. And I was a big kid now. Nine years old. At first, I didn't know where I was, except it sure wasn't my bedroom at home. It seemed too close, and it smelled different. I was cold and, and cramped, and I had to take a whiz something awful. There was a harsh burst of laughter that made me jerk in my bed, except it wasn't a bed. It was a bag. So she's some kind of fucking bag! Al Lathrop said from behind the canvas wall. But fucking's the operant word here. Camping. I was camping with my dad and his friends. I hadn't wanted to come. Yeah, but how do you get it up, Al? That's what I want to know. That was Scotty Norwis, another of dad's friends. His voice was slurred and furry and I started to feel afraid again. They were drunk. I just turn off the lights and pretend I'm with Carl Decker's wife, Al said, and there was another bellow of laughter that made me cringe and jerk in my sleeping bag. Oh, God. I needed to whiz, piss, make lemonade, whatever you wanted to call it, but I didn't want to go out there while they were drinking and talking. I turned to the tent wall and discovered I could see them. They were between the tent and the campfire, and their shadows, tall and alien-looking, were cast on the canvas. It was like watching a magic lantern show. I watched the shadow bottle go from one shadow hand to the next. You know what I'd do if I caught you with my wife? My dad asked Al. Probably ask if I needed any help, Al said, and there was another burst of laughter. 
The elongated shadow heads on the tent wall bobbed up and down, back and forth, with insectile glee. They didn't look like people at all. They looked like a bunch of praying mantises, and I was afraid. No, seriously, my dad said. Seriously. You know what I'd do if I caught somebody with my wife? What, Carl? That was Randy Earl. You see this? A new shadow on the canvas now. My father's hunting knife. The one he carried out in the woods. The one I later saw him gut a deer with, slamming it into the deer's guts to the hilt and then ripping upwards. The muscles in his forearms bulging, spilling out green and steaming intestines into a carpet of needles and moss. The firelight and the angle of the canvas turned the hunting knife into a spear. You see this son of a bitch? I catch some guy with my wife. I'd whip him over on his back and cut off his accessories. He'd be sitting down till the end of his days. <laughs> right, Carl? That was Hubie Levesque, the guide. I pulled my knees up to my chest and hugged them. I've never had to go to the bathroom so bad in my life, before or since. You're goddamn right, Carl Decker, my sterling dad said. Uh, what about the woman in this case, Carl? Al Lathrop asked. He was very drunk. I could even tell which shadow was his. He was rocking back and forth as if he was sitting in a rowboat instead of on a log by the campfire. That's what I want to know. What do you do about a woman who, who, lets, who lets someone in the back door, huh? The hunting knife that had turned into a spear moved slowly back and forth. My father said, the Cherokees used to slit their noses. The idea was to put a cunt right up on their faces so everyone in the tribe could see what part of them got them in trouble. My hands left my knees and slipped down to my crotch. I cupped my testicles and looked at the shadow of my father's hunting knife moving slowly back and forth. There were terrible cramps in my belly. I was going to whiz in my sleeping bag if I didn't hurry up and go. Slit their noses, huh? Randy said, that's pretty goddamn good. If they still did that, half the women in Placerville would have a snatch at both ends. Not my wife, my father said very quietly. And now the slur in his voice was gone. And the laughter at Randy's joke stopped in mid-roar. No, no, of course not, Carl, Randy said uncomfor uncomfortably. Hey, shit, <laughs> have a drink. My father's shadow tipped the bottle back. I wouldn't slit her nose, Al Lathrop said. I'd blow her goddamn cheating head off. There you go, Hubie said. I'll drink to it. I couldn't hold it anymore. I squirmed out of the sleeping bag and felt the cold October air bite into my body, which was naked except for a pair of shorts. It seemed like my cock wanted to shrivel right back into my body. And the one thing that kept it going around and around in my mind is still I was still partly asleep, I guess. And the whole conversation, it seemed like a dream. Maybe a continuation of the creaking monster in the alley. Was that when I was smaller? I used to get into Mum's bed and I used to get into Mum's bed after Dad had put on his uniform and gone off to work in Portland. I used to sleep beside her for an hour before breakfast. Dark, fear, firelight, shadows like praying mantises. I don't want to be out in these woods, 70 miles from the nearest town with these drunk men. I wanted my mother. I came out through the tent flap, and my father turned towards me. The hunting knife was still in his hand. He looked at me, and I looked at him. I've never forgotten 
that my dad, with a reddish beard stubble on his face and a hunting cap cocked on his head and that hunting knife in his hand. All the conversation stopped. Maybe they were wondering how much I had heard. Maybe they were even ashamed. What the hell do you want? My dad asked, sheathing the knife. Give him a drink, Carl, Randy said, and there was a roar of laughter. Al laughed so hard he fell over. He was pretty drunk. I got a whiz, I said. Then go do it, for Christ's sake, my dad said. I went over in the grove and tried to whiz. For a long time, it wouldn't come out. It was like a hot, soft ball of lead in my lower belly. I had nothing but a fingernail's length of penis. The cold had really shriveled it. At last, it did come in a great streaming flood, and when it was all out of me, I went back into the tent and got in my sleeping bag. None of them looked at me. They were talking about the war. They had all been in the war. My dad got his deer three days later, on the last day of the trip. I was with him. He got it perfectly, in the bunch of muscle between the neck and shoulder, and the buck went down in a heap, all grace gone. We went over to it. My father was smiling, happy. He had unsheathed his knife. I knew what was going to happen. And I knew I was going to be sick, and I couldn't help any of it. He planted a foot on either side of the buck and pulled one of its legs back and shoved the knife in. One quick upward rip, and its guts spilled out on the forest floor, and I turned around and heaved up my breakfast. When I turned back to him, he was looking at me. He never said anything, but I could read the contempt and disappointment in his eyes. I had seen it there often enough. I didn't say anything either. But if I had been able to, I would have said, It isn't what you think. That was the first and last time I ever went hunting with my dad. Fuck. Chapter 6 Al Lathrop was still thumbing through his textbook samples and pretending he was too busy to talk to me, when the intercom on Miss Marble's desk buzzed, and she smiled at me as if we had a great and sexy secret. You can go in now, Charlie. I got up. Sell those textbooks, Al! He gave me a quick, nervous, insincere smile. I, uh, I will, uh, Charlie. I went through the slatted gate, past the big safe set, into the wall on the right and Miss Marble's cluttered desk on the left. Straight ahead was a door with a frosted glass pane. Thomas Denver, principal, was lettered on the glass. I walked in. Mr. Denver was looking at the bugle, the school rag. He was a tall, cadaverous man who looked something like John Carradine. He was bald and skinny. His hands were long and full of knuckles. His tie was pulled down, and the top button on his shirt was undone. The skin on his throat looked grizzled and irritated from over-shaving. Sit down, Charlie. I sat down and folded my hands. I'm a great old hand folder. It's a trick I picked up from my father. Through the window behind Mr. Denver, I could see the lawn but not the fearless way it grew right up to the building. I was too high, and it was too bad. It might have helped, like a nightlight when you were small. Mr. Denver put the bugle down and leaned back in his chair. Kind of hard to see it that way, isn't it? He grunted. Mr. Denver was a crackerjack grunter. If there was a national grunting bee, I would put all my money on Mr. Denver. I brushed my hair away from my eyes. There was a picture of Mr. Denver's family on his desk, which was even more cluttered than Miss Marble's. The family looked well-fed and well-adjusted. His wife was sort of porky, but the two kids were cute as buttons and didn't look a bit like John Carradine. Two little girls, both blonde. Don Grace has finished his report, and I've had it since last Thursday. 
considering his conclusions and his recommendations as carefully as I can. We all appreciate this matter, and the seriousness of it. I've taken the liberty of discussing the whole thing with John Carlson also. How is he? I asked. Pretty well. He'll be back in a month, I should think. Well, that's something. It is. He blinked at me very quickly, the way lizards do. I didn't kill him. That's something. Yes. Mr. Denver looked at me steadily. Do you wish you had? No. He leaned forward. Drew his chair up to his desk. Looked at me. Shook his head. And began. I'm very puzzled when I have to speak the way I'm about to speak to you, Charlie. Puzzled and sad. I've been in the kid business since 1947, and I still can't understand these things. I feel what I have to say to you is right and necessary, but it also makes me unhappy, because I still can't understand why a thing like this happens. In 1959, we had a very bright boy. He beat up a junior high school girl quite badly with a baseball bat. Eventually, we had to send him to South Portland Correctional Institute. All he could say is that she wouldn't go out with him. Then he would smile. Mr. Denver shook his head. Don't bother. What? Don't bother trying to understand. Don't lose any sleep over it. But why, Charlie? Why did you do that? My God! He was on an operating table for nearly four hours. Why is Mr. Grace's question? I said. He's the school shrink. You? You only ask it because it makes a nice lead into your sermon. I don't want to listen to any more sermons. They don't mean shit to me. It's over. He was going to live or die. He lived. I'm glad. You do what you have to do. What you and Mr. Grace decided to do. You do what you have to. But don't you try to understand me. Charlie, understanding is part of my job. But helping you do your job isn't a part of my job. I said. So let me tell you one thing. To sort of open the lines of communication, okay? Okay. I held my hands tightly in my lap. They were trembling. I'm sick of you and Mr. Grace and all the rest of you. You used to make me afraid. And you still make me afraid. But now you make me tired, too. And I've decided that I don't have to put up with that shit. The way I am, I can't put up with that. What you think doesn't mean anything to me. You're not qualified to deal with me, so just stand back. I'm warning you, you are not qualified. My voice had risen to a trembling near shout. Mr. Denver sighed. So you may think, Charlie, but the laws of the state say otherwise. After having read Mr. Grace's report, I think I agree with him that you don't understand yourself or the consequences of what you did in Mr. Carlson's classroom. You are disturbed, Charlie. You are disturbed, Charlie. The Cherokees used to slit their noses so everyone in the tribe could see what part of them got them in trouble. The words echoed greenly in my head as if at great depths. They were shark words at deep fathoms. Jaws words come to gobble me up. Words with teeth and eyes. This is where I started to get it on. I knew it because the same thing that happened just before I gave Mr. Carlson the business was happening now. My hands stopped shaking. My stomach flutters subsided, and my whole middle felt cool and calm. I felt detached. 
not only from Mr. Denver and his overshaved neck, but from myself. I could almost float. Mr. Denver had gone on, something about proper counseling and psychiatric help, but I interrupted him. Mr. Man, you can go straight to hell. He stopped and put down the paper he had been looking at, so he wouldn't have to look at me. Something from my file, no doubt. The almighty file. The great American file. What? He said. In hell. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Any insanity in your family, Mr. Denver? I'll discuss this with you, Charlie. I won't engage in immoral sex practices. I finished for him. Just you and me, okay? First one to jack off wins the Putnam Good Fellowship Award. Fill your hand, partner. Get Mr. Grace in here. That's even better. We'll have a circle jerk. What? Don't, don't you get the message? You have to pull it out sometime, right? You owe it to yourself, right? Everybody has to get it on. Everybody has to have someone to jack off on. You've already set yourself up as a judge of what's right for me. Devils. Demon possession. Why did I hit that little girl with that baseball bat load? Load! The devil made me do it and I am so sorry. Why don't you admit it? You get a kick out of peddling my flesh. I'm the best thing that's happened to you since 1959. He was gawking at me openly. I had him by the short hair, knew it, and was savagely proud of it. On the one hand, he wanted to humor me and go along with me, because after all, isn't that what you do with disturbed people? On the other hand, he was in this kid business, just like he told me, and rule one in the kid business is don't let him give you no lip. Be fast with the command and the snappy comeback. Charlie, don't bother. I'm trying to tell you I'm tired of being masturbated on. Be a man, for God's sake, Mr. Denver. And if you can't be a man, at least pull up your pants and be a principal. Shut up, he grunted. His face had gone bright red. You're just pretty damn lucky you live in a progressive state and go to a progressive school, young man. You know where you'd, you know where you'd be otherwise? Peddling your papers in a reformatory somewhere, serving a term for criminal assault. I'm not sure you don't belong there anyway. You thank you, I said. He stared at me, his angry blue eyes fixed on mine, for treating me like a human, even if I had to piss you off to do it. That's real progress. I crossed my legs, being nonchalant. You want to talk about the panty raids you made the scene at while you were at Big U learning the kid business? Your mouth is filthy, he said deliberately, and so is your mind. Fuck you, I said, and laughed at him. He went an even deeper shade of scarlet and stood up. He reached slowly over the desk, slowly as if he needed oiling, and bunched up the shoulder of my shirt in his hand. You show some respect he said. He had really blown his cool and was not even bothering to use that really first-class grunt. You rotten little punk, you'll show me some respect. I could show you my ass and you'd kiss it, I said. Go on, tell me about the panty raids. You'll feel better. Throw us your panties, throw us your panties. He let go of me, holding his hand away from his body as if a rabid dog had just pooped on it. Get out! He said hoarsely, get your books, turn them in here, and then get out. Your expulsion and transfer to Green Mantle Academy is effective as of Monday. I'll talk to your parents on the telephone now. Get out! I don't want to have to look at you. I got up, unbuttoned the two bottom buttons on my shirt, pulled the tail out on one side, and unzipped my fly. Before he could move... I tore open the door and staggered into the outer office. Miss Marble and Al Lathrop were conferring at her desk, and they both looked up and winced when they saw me. They had obviously been playing the great American parlor game of, we don't really hear them, do we? You'd better get to him, 
I panted. We were sitting there talking about panty raids, and he just jumped over his desk and tried to rape me. I pushed him over the edge. No mean feat, considering he's been in the kid business for 29 years and was probably only 10 away from getting his gold key to the downstairs crapper. He lunged at me through the door. I danced away from him, and he stood there looking furious, silly, and guilty. All at once. Get somebody to take care of him, I said. He'll be, a su- he'll be sweeter after he gets it out of his system. I looked at Mr. Denver, winked, and whispered, Throw us your panties, right? Then I pushed out the slatted rail, walked slowly out the office door, buttoning my shirt and tucking it in, zipping my fly. There was plenty of time for him to say something, but he didn't say a word. That's when it really got rolling, because all at once, I knew he couldn't say a word. He was great at announcing the day's hot lunch over the intercom, but this was a different thing, joyously different. I had confronted him with exactly what he said was wrong with me, and he hadn't been able to cope with that. Maybe expected us to smile and shake hands and conclude my seven and one half semester stay at Placerville High with a literary critique of the bugle. But in spite of everything, Mr. Carlson and all the rest, he hadn't really expected any irrational act. Those things were all meant for the closet, rolled up beside those nasty magazines that you never show your wife. He was standing back there, vocal cords frozen. Not a word left in his mind to say. None of his instructors in dealing with the disturbed child, EDB-211, had ever told him he might someday have to deal with a student who would attack him on a personal level. And pretty quick he was going to be mad. That made him dangerous. Who knew better than me? I was going to have to protect myself. I was ready. And I had been ever since I decided that people might, just might, mind you, be following me around and checking up. I gave him every chance. I waited for him to charge out and grab me, all the way to the staircase. I didn't want salvation. I was either past that point or I never reached it at all. All I wanted was recognition. Or maybe for someone to draw a yellow plague circle around my feet. He didn't come out, and when he didn't, I went ahead and got it on. That was chapters 5 and 6 of Rage. Charlie has left the principal's office after his meeting with Mr. Decker, um, talking about what he did to Mr. Grace. He hurt Mr. Grace in his classroom. And I always want to make excuses for Charlie's behavior, but I'm not going to because that isn't fair. But the last words in this chapter are, I went ahead and got it on. And those are words we're going to hear one more time, I think. And I think we'll probably hit that next time, because this has been Dr. Peace Theater, and my name is Dr. Dennis Business. And as always, my friends...